Now, of course, you remember what we've said, brothers and sisters, on our, on our considerations so far of the cherubic faces of the Gospels. Do you remember that what we said concerning the face of the lion was that the lion was a symbol, was it not? And when we came to the face of the ox in the Gospel of Mark, we found that the ox was a symbol of something. So the lion was a symbol of kingship and the ox was a symbol of service. So when we come to the Gospel of Luke, we wouldn't say, would we, that this is the face of the perfect man. Because the man is a symbol, just like the lion is, and just like the ox, and just like the eagle. We didn't say that Christ was the perfect lion. We said he's the perfect whatever the lion represents. So this is not the gospel here of the perfect man, but of whatever the man represents. Well, let's just imagine for a moment then that we were face to face with a man this time. Not a lion, not an ox, but a man. Right up close, face to face with a man. What things might impress us as we looked upon his countenance in contrast to the other cherubic faces? Well, I think the first thing would be his understanding eyes that these eyes are unlike any eyes of an animal. These are understanding eyes. And if we were to look at, at the expression of the man, we would see a sympathetic expression, that fellow feeling of understanding that can only be found when gazing upon another human being. And were the man to open his mouth, we wouldn't hear the roar of the lion or the lowing of the ox. We'd hear the intelligent speak of communication, one with another. So how's the man used in Scripture then? Well, do you remember in one passage we're told in Ecclesiastes 8 verse 1 that, that wisdom makes a man's face to shine. In fact, we're told in Acts chapter 6 and verse 15 that when the council steadfastly looked upon the face of Stephen, they saw, as it were, the face of an angel, the wisdom of a man that caused his face to shine. So the man is used in the sense of the spirit of wisdom. And here's another thing, and, and we're going to, I'm going to get you to turn this passage up, or this series of passages up, because here's another sense in which the face of the man or the idea of the man is to be found in scripture. It's in the book of Hebrews and starting in chapter 2. The man. You see I think that the man of the gospel of Luke is not just any ordinary man. He's a special man. He's a representative man. He's whatever the face of the man is going to symbolize. Now, you might remember that in the history of Israel, there were two people, two officers in particular, that had to be drawn from amongst mankind. One was the king, of course, who had to be taken from among his brethren, says Deuteronomy chapter 17. But clearly, it's not the king that Luke has in mind, because that's already been covered by the cherubic face of the lion. But do you see what it says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17? Wherefore, in all things, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, but to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And again in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And again in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. For every high priest taken 
from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity and you see the man here is used in the, in the principle or to teach the principle of the sympathy of care you see I think the face of the man in the gospel of Luke is the face of the priest a special man drawn from humanity that he might minister with sympathy amongst his brethren. Well, what about the man in the tribe then? Come back to Genesis chapter 49 and again to the promise of Jacob to his sons. Because in Genesis chapter 49, we're told this. Now, by the way, what tribe flew the ensign flag with the cherubic face of the man upon it? The answer is not the tribe of Judah, which was the face of the lion, and not the tribe of Ephraim, which was the face of the ox, but the tribe of Reuben. Now, do you see what Genesis 49 says about Reuben in verse 3? Reuben, said Jacob, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Or as one translation translates that word, the preeminence of dignity and the preeminence of power. Reuben, thou art my firstborn. And the rabbinical writers tell us that the reason why the flag of Reuben had the face of a man upon it was to indicate that he was the firstborn son of the family. Now, if you were the firstborn son... What peculiar rights belong to you as firstborn? And you'll remember that there were three things, were there not? Well, what were they? The responsibility of priest, priesthood, the right of rulership, and the privilege of the double portion. Weren't they the three things that belonged to the firstborn? The responsibility to be priest in the family, the right of rulership, and the privilege of the double portion. And you see, what it says is this, Genesis 49, verse 3, read it again. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the preeminence of dignity, the right of priesthood, and the preeminence of power, the right of rulership. But because you are as unstable as water, verse 4, thou shalt not have the preeminence, as Rodahims says. And so the rights of the firstborn were to be removed from Reuben. And by the way, you'll know how the story plays out. Because to whom did the right of priesthood go? Why, to the tribe of Levi. And to whom did the right of rulership transfer? Why, to the tribe of Judah. And to whom was the double portion passed? Why, to the tribe of Joseph. And Reuben lost all his firstborn rights to other tribes, but one of those rights from the beginning was the right of priesthood. And the face of the man flew upon the flag of the tribe of, Jubin, of Reuben rather, to show that he was the firstborn son and therefore had the right of priesthood in his family. You'll remember that when they came to Mount Sinai, we're told that Moses was instructed that the priests must sanctify themselves before they came near God. And yet that episode, as well before the house of Levi, has been consecrated as the priests. Whoever the priests were in Exodus 19, they weren't the tribe of Levi. They were the firstborn sons of the families who were all priests, as was Reuben. So what about the face of the man in the prophet then? Well, now, which prophet is this? Well, we've looked at Isaiah and seen the face of the lion. 
We've looked at Jeremiah and seen the face of the ox. In fact, a brother asked me about that the other day, and so just one cross-reference you might like to take a note of is that in Jeremiah chapter 11, Jeremiah himself says this in verse 19, I was like a lamb or an ox brought to the slaughter, he says, Jeremiah 11 verse 19, the face of the ox or the servant in Jeremiah. And now we come to the prophet Ezekiel. So let's come to Ezekiel chapter 1 and see how the, how the book of Ezekiel opens. Well, before the book of Ezekiel opens, let me ask you what the theme of the book of Ezekiel is all about. Would anyone like to suggest what the overarching theme of the book of Ezekiel is? What thinkest thou? What's the theme of the book of Ezekiel? It's about one key phrase, one key idea. Now it's not about the Son of Man, although that's clearly a title, and we'll come back to that, by the way. Oh, so would you just like to say that again? The Son of who? Son of Man. Why, that's interesting. Luke, the face of the man. The prophet Ezekiel is described, is it 94 times, as the Son of Man. Yes, that's clearly the title that's attributed to Ezekiel himself. But what's the theme of the book of Ezekiel? Sorry? Repent from sin. Now, I think the theme of the book of Ezekiel is the glory of God. The glory departs from the temple, departs to the Mount of Olives, departs away, and finally returns back to the temple at the end of, of the book of Ezekiel. It's about the glory of God in its various stages of manifestation. And by the way, it begins in the temple and ends in a temple. And by the time the book of Ezekiel finishes, there will be a priest in the temple, will there not? A prince and a priest who offers sacrifices in that temple. And we won't turn to it, but if you go to the very last chapter of the book of Ezekiel, you'll find there's a portion given to a company of priests, but they're not Levites. It's another order of priests, the sons of Zadok. And they are given a portion near the sanctuary and another priest ministers in a temple by the time the book of Ezekiel comes to a close. But have a look at the opening of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1, verse 1, It came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives. Of course, we're not told what the thirtieth year relates to. It's not the thirtieth year of their captivity. It doesn't actually say what it is at all. And yet the suggestion is that in Ezekiel 1 verse 1, that the 30th year is actually the 30th year of the prophet himself. And I'll tell you why that's interesting, because in the margin it cross-refers you to Numbers chapter 4 and verse 3. And Numbers 4 verse 3 says that the 30th year is why the year that priests began their ministration before God. Well, what do we know of Ezekiel? Verse 3. In the 30th year, verse 3, the word of Yahweh came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, says the record. So you see, what Ezekiel is beginning is his priestly ministrations. It's the 30th year of his own life. He's about to begin his work before God. And do you know what the record says? That when Ezekiel, in his 30th year, begins his ministrations, and we're expressly told that he's a priest, verse 1 says, it came to pass in the 30th year, as I was among the captives, that the heavens were opened. Now, where have we heard all that before, brothers and sisters, somewhere in the Bible? Well, come and have a look at the Gospel of Luke. And chapter 3, and see if this is not the same face as the priest of Ezekiel, who's called the Son of Man. Do you see what it says in Luke chapter 3, in verse 21? <laughs> now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. 
That's Ezekiel 1, verse 1. Oh, and do you see what it says in verse 23? And Jesus himself began to be about why 30 years of age, says Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Why would we need to know that Jesus was about 30, do you think? And of course you would know that only Luke tells us that important detail. This is another priest beginning his priestly ministrations. Oh, come back to Luke chapter 1. Of course, you know how the Gospel of Luke opens. How does the whole Gospel of Luke open? The opening of the Gospel of Luke. Well, after the initial comments in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, about the reason for writing this Gospel, this is how the Gospel opens. Luke 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea, a certain priest. And the whole of the Gospel of Luke will open with the account of a priest officiating in the temple of God and coming forth to bring forth the blessing of God to the people. That's how the whole Gospel is going to open, is it not? And from the vision of Zechariah the priest, this Gospel will then move to the story of Mary and the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose story, by the way, and interestingly enough, is inextricably linked to the story of another child and another woman called Elizabeth, with whom Mary shares time. But Elizabeth, of course, is of the priestly line, and Mary is somehow connected with her. So you see what Luke chapter 2 says... Luke 2 says in verse 6, And so it was, while they were in Bethlehem, the days were accomplished that Mary should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Firstborn son to whom the right of priesthood originally belonged. Before the tribe of Levi were ever appointed. Is there a genealogy in the Gospel of Luke? The answer is yes, in Luke chapter 3. And the genealogy of Luke chapter 3 travels in the opposite direction to the genealogy of Matthew. Matthew comes as it were, from the time of Abraham up through David to finally reach our Lord Jesus Christ. But the genealogy of Luke's gospel will travel in the opposite direction, tracing from Christ backwards, 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 backwards. Well, you see what it says, Luke 3, verse 23, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, And it's going to come back, back, back. Verse 36, through the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Shem, who of course we believe was Melchizedek, a priest after a different order to that of Levi. And finally, verse 38 says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was... The firstborn son of God, was he not? And to whom therefore belonged the right of priesthood. Do you remember in the days of Nehemiah we're told that there were some priests that were disbarred from the priesthood because they could not trace their genealogy Well, the priest of this gospel is able to trace his genealogy right back to the common stock of humanity itself, to Abraham, sorry, to Adam, the firstborn son of God, where the rite of priesthood first began. Oh yes, this priest knows his genealogy. This is the priest for all, the redeemer of everyone, the helper of mankind, the physician for sin, the saviour of the world the face of the perfect man in this gospel will actually be the face of the perfect priest. 
So three major themes then in the Gospel of Luke. The first is, and I'm just going to read these through quickly because you'll receive details of these in your handout, God willing, at the end of the Bible school. Here's the first key theme, I think, in the Gospel of Luke, and that is the power of universal compassion. The power of universal compassion. You see, this is a man who reaches out to touch everyone. It, it, it's like this, you see. In Luke 7, he shows the miracle of life for the bereft widow. Again, in Luke, in Luke 7, he will show the blessing of forgiveness for the sinful woman. In Luke 13, the wonder of release for the despondent cripple. In Luke 17, the joy of cleansing for the despised alien. In Luke 19, the warmth of approval for the social outcast. In Luke 22, the gentleness of care for the smitten enemy. In Luke 23, the promise of hope for the penitent thief. And we'll find, brothers and sisters, that this gospel pre Eminently, this gospel is the story of a man who reaches out to touch everyone with his compassion, which is exactly what we would expect of a priest, is it not? This man touches Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female. He's a priest for them all. And this gospel will portray our Lord Jesus Christ in that special way. And here's the second theme, which you might think strange, but is actually extremely interesting. It's the blessing of personal fellowship. Do you know that one of the peculiar features of the Gospel of Luke is that Jesus is always eating? He's always eating meals. Wherever he goes, he's busy eating. There's three meals recorded that the Lord eats in the Gospel of Matthew. There's three recorded in the Gospel of Mark. There's four meals in the Gospel of John. But the Lord has nine meals in the Gospel of Matthew. He eats a lot more in this Gospel. And by the way, I think that's absolutely extraordinary for this reason. That if you go back to the book of the law, you'll find that the high priest of Israel, by virtue of the constraints of the law was unable to eat with anybody apart from his own family. Only they could eat of the holy things, you see. And this man who was supposed to be in fellowship with all his people could never e even eat a meal with them and share that time together. Such were the constraints of the law of Moses upon the priest after the order of Levi and Aaron. But of course, the priest of the Gospel of Luke is not a priest, is he, after the order of Levi? This is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, you know what it says concerning Melchizedek in Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20, is that after the battle of the kings, Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine and sat down to a fellowship meal with Abraham. You see, this priest is able to dine with those amongst whom he labors. And you'll find in the Gospel of Luke that this is preeminently the Gospel of the Lord eating the meal of fellowship with everyone he comes into contact with. Marvelous thing. And here's the third one. What, we would ex what would we expect, brothers and sisters, of a priest? Apart from the power of his compassion and the blessing of fellowship with him, what else preeminently would we expect of a priest but that he would be a man of prayer? Would he not? Well, you see, the example of constant prayer is a dominant theme in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Matthew, the Lord is recorded as having given three prayers. Of course, we know the Lord prayed a lot more than that, but the Gospel only records three prayers. In the Gospel of Mark, he gives four prayers. In the Gospel of John, he gives one. In the Gospel of Luke, the Lord gives ten prayers. He's the priest, you see, at prayer for his people. Oh, and let me just remind you of one unique feature of the prayers of this particular gospel. Do you know that when the Lord hung upon the cross, he uttered a number of different prayers, did he not? 
Where might you expect to find this particular prayer recorded out of the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ? In which gospel do you think these words are recorded? Uniquely recorded. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, that's the intercessory prayer for others that a priest makes, isn't it? Only Luke records that prayer in chapter 23 and verse 34. Luke alone. The prayer of the priest who prays on behalf of his people. Because that's what the priest did. He brought the breastplate so that all the tribes of the saints might be engraven upon his heart when he went into the holy place to pray on behalf of his people. And in this gospel preeminently, we will see the Lord at prayer. It's exactly what we'd expect, you see, of, of a good and faithful high priest. In Luke's gospel, we've got two unique parables on prayer. Luke 18, verses 1 to 8, the need for persistence in prayer. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14, the need for humility in prayer. Only found in Luke's gospels, special parables on prayer. Do you remember in the Lord's prayer, in the gospel of Matthew, that it says this, Forgive us our debts. Who forgives debts? But a king. And that's the word used in the Lord's Prayer in the account of it in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 18 gives the story of a certain king that had two creditors and he frankly forgave all of their debts. A king forgives debts. Forgive us our debts, says the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's account. But in Luke 11, that's not what Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer says. Luke's account says, forgive us our sins. You see, a king forgives debts, but a priest forgives sins. Does he not? Oh, and by the way, that's one of the key words you see in the Gospel of Luke. Harmatalos. The word sinners. Found five times in the Gospel of Matthew, and six times in Mark, and four times in John. But 18 times in the Gospel of Luke. Sinners. Why so many sinners in the Gospel of Luke? Well, because this is the... These are they amongst whom the priest ministers. He comes to deal with Sinners. And to help them. That's where the focus of his labors are. Oh, and here's another key word. In the Greek, the word for salvation is sozo, S-O-Z-O. And the words out of derived from sozo translated either save or savior or salvation. I found 15 times in Matthew, 15 times in Mark, 8 times in John but 27 times in the Gospel of Luke. Salvation. Salvation, salvation, salvation. You see, this is the essence of the priest's ministrations. He comes to save. He comes to save people from their sin. That's what this Gospel is all about. If you come to Luke chapter 19, we're told this. This is actually a, a unique story, I think, in the... Gospel of Luke. In Luke 19, in verse 1, the record says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. But he did seek to see Jesus, who he was. And we're told in this record, verse 7, that when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half my goods I give to the poor. <clears throat> and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is 
salvation come to this house? Who could bring salvation into a house, brothers and sisters, but a priest? Do you know what's interesting about this story in Luke chapter 19? The city of Jericho was a city of priests. There were 12,000 priests living in Jericho in the days of Jesus. 12,000 of them. And not one of them was able to help Zacchaeus. And Jesus visited Zacchaeus as a priest and reached out to restore one who had been left alone by a city full of priests. They saw the sinful man. Christ saw the repentant one. And the record closes with these words in Luke 19 and verse 10. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, isn't that the spirit of priesthood, do you think? Do you know that in Luke's Gospel, just a, a couple of pages back in Luke chapter 15, we're given a parable at the beginning of this chapter, which is the parable of the lost sheep. Now, the lost sheep is also found in the Gospel of Matthew, parable of the lost sheep. But Luke is going to go on and do something that Matthew doesn't. Luke's going to give a second parable, and the second parable will be the story of the lost coin. And then Luke is going to go on and give a third parable in Luke 15, which is going to be the story of the lost sons. Two of them who are both lost, by the way. And you suddenly find that Luke chapter 15 is a collection of parables which collectively we might describe as the parables of the lost. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost sons. And that collection of parables is unique to the Gospel of Luke. Why would the parables of the lost be found in this Gospel? Well, brothers and sisters, for the very reason that was given to us in the book of Hebrews, because is not this the spirit of priesthood? When the book of Hebrews says that a priest can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, that's what the priests come to do, isn't it? To find the lost ones? Do you remember in Luke chapter 4, we're told that the Lord on one occasion went into a synagogue and stood up to read. It's not the only story, not the only account of the fact that Jesus went into the synagogue to stand up and read, but it says in Luke 4 verse 17, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened the book he found the place where it was written. And do you know what's interesting is that only Luke's gospel tells us the particular passage that the Lord was going to read from. Only Luke tells us where exactly Christ was reading from. Luke alone says, ah, he was reading from Isaiah 61. And you see what Isaiah 61 starts with? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because... He has anointed me. Ah. So this is a, a reading about an anointed man. Well, who was anointed? Well, it could have been a king. But it might also have been a priest, might it not? And in fact, the reading of Isaiah 61 is going to go on to talk about priestly things. To preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And the acceptable year of the Lord, we believe, was the year of jubilee ushered in by the priests blowing on the trumpets. Oh yes, this man is anointed to priesthood. Only Luke tells us the passage that Jesus was reading from on this occasion. Do you know that one of the key themes in the Gospel of Luke, remember how we said that each Gospel's got a structure? 
The Gospel of Matthew is built around the speeches of the king. The Gospel of Mark is built around the two halves of the work of the servant. He comes to minister, he comes to offer his life. Well, here's, I think, the structure of the Gospel of Luke. It's built around the story of a journey. It's the journey to Jerusalem. Like no other Gospel, this Gospel constantly tells us that Christ is on the road to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. He's passing to Jerusalem. He's always focused on getting to Jerusalem. In fact, in terms of references to Jerusalem in the Gospels, Jerusalem is mentioned 13 times in Matthew, 11 times in Mark, 13 times in John, but 33 times in Luke. And you see, I think the reason for that focus is because the priest officiates in Salem. That's where he belongs. That's where his work is. That's where we'll find him. And the whole of Luke's gospel is the story of this man getting to that place so that his priestly ministrations might be accomplished. Well, let's have a look at the close of the gospel, shall we, and see whether the gospel closes with the same spirit with which it opens. Luke chapter 24, at the end of the story. And this is what the record says, reading from perhaps verse 49. Jesus says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high until you be endued with power from on high. Now, just hold your hand in Luke 24 for a, moment, for a moment in your right hand and come back to Exodus chapter 29 in your left hand. Exodus chapter 29 in your left hand. So Jesus says to his disciples, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now that word endued is the same word found in the Septuagint translation of Exodus 29 in the following places. Verse 5. And thou shalt take the garments, and thou shalt endue them upon Aaron. Thou shalt clothe them upon Aaron. The coat, the robe, the ephod, the breastplate, and the curious girdle of the ephod. Thou shalt endue the garments upon him. Verse 8. And thou shalt bring his sons, and clothe them. Exodus 29, and verse, 20, uh, verse 30. Maybe starting from verse 29. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him, to be anointed therein, to be consecrated in them. And that son that is to be priest in his stead shall put them on, shall endue them seven days. You see, this word enduo is a word used concerning the investiture of the priests with their holy garments. And the Lord says... In Luke 24, verse 49, you wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed upon. And you see, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it would both anoint them and clothe them for their priestly office. Now, you see what Luke 24 says. Verse 50. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. Brothers and sisters, who lifts up their hands to bless the people? That's the priest, is it not? That's Psalm 134, verse 2. Lift up the hands and bless those that minister 
to God in the sanctuary. In fact, do you know that that's, I think the idea of lifting up the hands and blessing on this occasion comes all the way back to Leviticus chapter 9, verse 22, on the very day of the consecration of Aaron as priest. It says that when Aaron had been consecrated as priest, he stepped forward, and it says he lifted his hands and blessed the people on the day he became high priest. And the Lord takes his people out to Bethany, lifts up his hands, and bless them. You see, this is the priest, and he's more than just the priest, brothers and sisters, because may I remind you of how this gospel began. It begins with the vision of a priest who comes out of the temple and is smitten dumb so that he was unable to bless the people. Zacharias, the priest after the order of Aaron, could not bless the people in Luke 1. And now the gospel will close with another priest after another order who can truly lift up his hands and bless his people. And not just his people, but his sons, who are going to manifest the face of the priest after he's gone. And so Luke 24 says, verse 50, he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, says verse 51, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them, and why, carried up into heaven. Carried up into heaven. Of course, you know what that means. You see, Christ is the high priest on the occasion of Luke 24, verse 51, was going into the one place where all the other priests could not go. Was he not? He was going into the most holy place itself. As Hebrews 9, 24 says, Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Isn't that where he was going in Luke 24, verse 51, when he was carried up from them? Oh yes, this priest does better than ministering simply in the temple on earth. This priest can take his ministrations into the very presence of God. And verse 53 of, of Luke 24 says, concerning those that were left behind after his departure, it says they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. See that word continually? It's the same word in Hebrews 9 verse 6 when it says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the tabernacle, always, continually. The priests went in there. And now it says that it is the disciples of Jesus who are continually in the temple. The temple? Why would the disciples be found in the temple? Luke 23, verse, Luke 24, verse 53. Well, where else would we expect to find them, brothers and sisters, given that this is a company of priests? awaiting consecration to office. Where else would we expect to find them but in the temple? So you see, the commission of Matthew's gospel is clearly a king commanding his ambassadors, and the commission that ends Mark's gospel is clearly a master sending forth his servants to labor. Would you not say that the closing commission of Luke's gospel is a high priest? Sending forth his sons for priestly ministration? I think so. Oh yes, I think that this is what the gospel of the man is all about. So let's just summarize our thoughts. The face of the man in Luke is the face of the perfect priest. Luke depicts Christ from the standpoint of his intercessory spirit and sympathetic care. His intercessory spirit and his sympathetic care. And now our summary phrase. 
For the Gospel of Matthew, remember, that mercy which rules. For the Gospel of Mark, that humility which serves. And now for the Gospel of Luke, that compassion which saves. He was all of these, brothers and sisters, the man of this Gospel. 